Well, thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Seba, for the present for the introduction. And um, yeah, so basically, um, I work at the physics department of the Autonomous University of Barcelona, uh, the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. And I'm going to be telling you about thermal transport in nanostructured and disordered solids. So basically, the uh, idea of my presentation is showing you some of the measurements that we've been doing in the lab for the past few years, in which um, I will show you three different systems that are for thin films, nanowires, and other organic thin films that are measured with three different techniques, but closely related. They are electrically based techniques, uh, three omega and related uh, techniques. And basically, I'm going to show you how with these materials, we can reach a very low levels of thermal conductivity by just impacting on, on, on the phonon transfer by using different, different systems, either super lattices, mass, mass gradients, uh, porosity, about here by doing disorder in this organic system. So I basically will try to, to show you some of the resources that we're having in the lab. In the lab. I, I will start with this silicon uh, germanium graded super lattices in which we can get a reduction of the thermal conductivity from the, from the, from the previous elements to values which are even below the thin film alloy limit, which is kind of the standard that we can see for the impairing the, the phonon transport. I'll show you after results on porous silicon nanowires where we have different structures, these suspended structures that were developed uh, many years ago by the CM co workers, in which we can uh, tackle and measure the, uh, the, the thermal conductivity or thermal conductance of uh, silicon nanowires. In this case, they are porous silicon nanowires, they have very low thermal, thermal conductance. And then I will go into a technique that we have developed in the lab in the last few years which we can now measure the in-plane thermal, the in -plane thermal conductivity of, uh, of layers. And I'll show you how we, uh, how we uh, use this technique in order to measure organic materials and to determine an isotropy in those materials. And I'll show you how uh, we can change the molecular anisotropy in those materials and how this highly sensitive technique is quite useful in order to understand the molecular orientation of those, those systems. I will not go in detail through the techniques, uh, I will just detail a little bit more this one, and I will try to put the focus a little bit more on the materials and on the reason for the decrease of the thermal of the thermal conductivity. Okay, let me go through first the silicon germanium graded uh, super uh, super lattices. So this is a uh, sorry, this is work that is done in collaboration with different groups at the UAB, UAB campus. In particular, the growth of these materials is done by uh, the IGMA group, Alonso, my Isabel Alonso, Michael Garriga, and Alejandro, Alejandro Goni. Uh, the idea of this work was to try to understand if we could get very low values of the thermal conductivity by using concentration gradients of germanium and by using super lattices that had not very small periods like other people has done in the literature, but using quite long periods and did that in our case, go from 10 to 40 to 40 nanometers approximately. So the idea here, in those materials is that they are grown by molecular beam, beam epitaxy. The silicon, they're grown at very low temperature in order to impose a predefined concentration gradient. So differently to what happens in the literature that people has formed this type of super lattices, the gradients that you both have at the interface, they are done because of the high temperature of the growth. And there, there, are, there, there is segregation at the interfaces. So you, you get these gradients. Here, the gradients are done uh, in situ during, during, during the growth. And therefore, we control the concentration gradients that we have on the materials by changing the germanium rate, the, the, the germanium uh, rate here. So we can go, if we have a silicon substrate, so we have this buffer layer, then we start with a silicon rich to a silicon germanium, silicon rich to silicon germanium, and we go on and typically for four, for four periods. No? Uh, so here we can change in all these materials the concentration gradients, the, the total amount of germanium that we have in the, in the material, the total thickness and the period of thickness. And you'll see that all these parameters are very important in order to tackle to determine the value of the thermal conductivity on those, on those systems. We also have grown one layer, one super lattice that, that is slightly thicker and it's quite important for, the, uh, for, the, for understanding what's going on on this system. It's a 16 period super lattice with a 30% approximately of uh, concentration, but this is slightly thicker, 700 nanometers with a period of 42 uh, nano, nanometers. Uh, we have done direct and inverse growth. So it basically means in some materials, we start by silicon rich and some others we start by germanium rich, but I will not go into detail on the effect of this, uh, this inverse growth. 
So let me go a little bit onto the characterization of those materials because it's important in order to understand the effect uh, on, the, on the thermal conductivity. These are the four previous samples. Uh, they have sharp uh, interfaces. They are, just, they are pseudomorphic. So basically they grow epitaxially with the substrate. They implant, they implant lattice parameter of the super lattice is the same as the one that we have of the, of the, of the substrate. They have a good uh, periodicity. We see here by this, uh, uh, by this, uh, by these fringes here that, that we have in the, in the high resolution is reflection pattern. And we have been able by doing uh, uh, TEM to, uh, to, to map the concentration profiles. And this is quite important for the analysis that we'll be doing later. You see that these profiles, they are uh, anisotropic. That basically means that at one side of the interface, they are different than from the other side of the interface. And we have different types of profiles that might in principle impact differently the value of the thermal conductivity in our, in our sample. So basically we can say that we have sharp interfaces with asymmetric compositional profiles that the electron diffraction patterns that are not show so that all these materials are single crystalline and they have a pseudomorphic growth. And importantly, that basically means that the dislocation density in those systems is uh, well below 10 to the nine square centimeter. That basically means, means that any misfit dislocation that we might have in those systems is not enough to impact on the thermal conductivity of those, of those materials. The 16 period sample is a slightly, it's a slightly different. So of course it's larger. So we have more, 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 more super lattices. This is the, the composition of the composition profile. In this, because uh, we wanted to do a, a different measurement at the beginning, we, we wanted to measure the thermal conductivity in both directions of the, of the layer. So we grew a, a one micron silicon. Okay, this is single crystalline in this region, but this is uh, nano crystalline in this region. This is polycrystalline. This is something that we have to take into account, of course, when we measure, when we determine the thermal conductivity of this of this sample. And this sample has also is slightly partially relaxed. So you see that the this is the, uh, the the silicon substrate. This is the super lattice. There is a small uh, change in the in the in the plane lattice parameter. And basically, this is telling that we have one dislocation every two hundred unit cells, and we we count into the number of dislocations that we have due to this uh, partial relaxation, it's around 8, 10, 9. And this is again below what is considered to be uh, important in order to impair the thermal conductivity in this silicon germanium super lattices that is above 10 to the 10 or 5, 10 to the 10 uh, dislocations per, per square centimeter. Uh, why we do this silicon germanium super lattice as well? The idea is very simple. We all know that when we have an alloy, we can decrease the thermal conductivity of a material because of this mass scattering. And therefore this is quite well understood in silicon germanium. Silicon, pure silicon is 150, germanium is 60. But if you now start and do an alloy, you get this minimum of the thermal conductivity. Okay, uh, there is like a plateau that goes from 20 to 50, 60 atomic percent in which you have a very uh, almost equal value of the thermal conductivity. If you go instead of bulk to thin films, you may get even lower values of the thermal conductivity because now there is some additional scattering of phonons due to this uh, thin, uh, due to the thin, thin film. And this is what we call the thin film alloy limit that of course its value depends a little bit on composition, but it's quite fixed. It also depends on thickness. So this value here tells you that you can produce a thin film alloy that has a lower thermal conductivity than the bulk. And that was demonstrated quite a few years ago. So by using this, alloy, thin film, super lattices, you can basically affect the phonon mean free paths of phonons at different wavelengths, okay? And if you have, for instance, crystalline silicon with the phonon mean free paths as a function of frequency that goes more or less like this, this is a schematics. So if you do alloying, of course, you are gonna affect mainly high frequency phonons. So you are gonna decrease the mean free path of those phonons, okay? Which at the end is gonna, have an effect on the on the thermal conductivity. If you go into a super lattice or thin films, but a super lattice, you will have an effect on the low medium range uh, phonons in this in this in this regime over here. And of course, if you can have a super lattice in which you can have this mixing, then you can probably benefit from those two reductions, and you, you can have a system a system in which you can have an even lower thermal thermal conductivity. Okay, this was a really dumb some years ago where they built this. A very small period super lattices in which you have segregation and then you have this, this mixing of silicon and germanium and you could see that there was a reduction of the thermal conductivity in some cases even below 
the thin film allow limit, which is kind of the minimum of the thermal conductivity in those systems. Of course, you can get this um, more or less a reduction in the, in the thermal conductivity by increasing germanium content, also by being in this, in this region over here. By decreasing super lattice period, super lattice period has an effect on the on the on the on the thermal conductivity on the on the on the on, on this region on this region over here the mid frequency phonons and also by increasing of course the intermixing in which you again uh, are favoring the alloy and they are reducing the thermal the thermal conductivity. So we do measurements in this system that they are they are thin films. We do measurements by the by the three omega method in which we basically. Uh, well, go with a with a current in omega. Then we have a power release in two omega, temperature increase in, in two omega, and then we measure the three omega the three omega voltage. We do that in uh, typically in differential mode, and at the end we can extract the thermal conductivity of the of the material. And these are cross plane measurements. So we are measuring the thermal conductivity of, of the material in this direction. We ensure that our geometry is uh, one in which we have a one-dimensional heat transfer. We obey several conditions that have to be satisfied for this one-dimensional transfer, and then you can solve the one-dimensional Fourier equation, and then you can you can get to this uh, to this uh, relation of the thermal conductivity with the with the delta t, and this is the delta t that you have in the field, okay? That we typically measure as a function of of, of frequency. Okay, so let me show you some of the measurements. These are different super lattices, the one that I showed you before. This is the thermal conductivity and this is temperature. So of course, all these measurements that, that I'll be showing you are done inside cryostat, they're done in vacuum. So we don't care here about convection or any of those, of those issues. So uh, here you can see first that there is a very small temperature dependence in, the, in this temperature regime. This is well known, and this is very different to what happens to, to bulk materials, to silicon or germanium. And this is because in this regime here, where unclap scattering, it starts to be important. Here we have another scattering mechanism that are important, and therefore we have a behavior that is very similar to the one that happens in disordered and amorphous materials on all non-crystalline non materials. We have like two uh, bones of uh, thermal conductivity. The one of this sample that is uh, this has this name is 4P6. This one is the one. The super lattice with the shortest period has 27 nanometers, with a, with a low thickness, 110, and with a high germanium content. So at the end, this is telling you that these three parameters, they have influence on the thermal conductivity, high germanium content, low thickness, and short periods, they result in low thermal, thermal conductivity in our samples. This is qualitative, of course. And uh, the one that has the larger thermal conductivity is the one with the largest period, 42 nanometers, of course, a higher uh, thickness because we have four periods and they have a low germanium content. So generally, these three parameters, these two are linked, are telling you which is qualitatively the uh, the impact of uh, uh, on uh, on the thermal conductivity of those of those materials. Importantly, the period is defined in this way. Okay, is, is the is the, the defined by this silicon rich to this germanium rich region, and we have in all in these super lattices we have these four these four, uh, four periods. Um, okay, so this is a BC slide. So let me try to go uh, as low in this one. So this is thermal conductivity. And now we plot it as a function of the period length and as a function of the total thickness. And here we have a bunch of different measurements by other people that has measured super lattices. Uh, this reference here, uh, this is our work. This is the work here for these super lattices. And this is also represented here by the, by, the empty, by, by the empty circles. The numbers that you see here, they correspond in this left graph to the germanium concentration. But here we are plotting that as a function of the period length. And here the numbers, they correspond to the number of periods, okay? So what you see generally is something that in general, the thermal conductivity decreases when you decrease the super lattice period. This is a general rule. Of course, that, that depends. The details may depend a little bit on the concentration of germanium that you have on your, on your system. But you can see that there is a general trend that the thermal conductivity increases with the, with the, with the period. It's also true that our thermal conductivity for the period that we have is smaller than what we should have. So for this period, we should have probably uh, thermal conductivities that are well above here, but we have thermal conductivities that, that are quite below what we might expect at the beginning. Uh, here we compare with the total thickness, 
And of course, when you reduce thickness, again, you have a reduction in the thermal conductivity. Uh, and I'm also plotting here this dashed line, the green line, which is the thin film alloy limit, which basically this is this thin film that has this different thickness and with a germanium, it's, it's an alloy, so it, it is not a super lattice, it's an alloy, and it has, in this case, a germanium concentration of 20%, which is slightly smaller uh, than, well, it's the same kind, similar to some of our super lattice and smaller than some other ones. Our super lattices, they go from 17 to 25 or to 30%. So we have in all cases that the thermal conductivity of the super lattice is slightly even more, more or less similar or slightly above the thin film alloy limit. So we don't beat this thin film alloy limit a low value, unless the case of the system uh, pre super lattices in which we are clearly below this thin film alloy limit. And we try to understand why with this super lattice we are able to, to, to reduce the thermal conductivity below the thin film alloy limit. And if we are able to produce other super lattices, we have long periods in which we can do that. These super lattices that have uh, below the thin film alloy limit, they have a lot of interfaces. Okay, you see it's 50 periods and 100 periods, and they have very small periods. The period of this super lattice is around three, five nanometers. It's much smaller than the ones that we are using in our, in our case. So for that, we uh, did a simulation by lattice dynamics. This was done by David Donadio at UC Davis and by Sunda, Sunda Chen, one of his uh, students. And basically what they did is they replicate exactly the compositional gradients that we have in our system, okay? By building the compositional profiles, the, 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 the exact compositional profiles that we have in our samples. And uh, basically here we have now the thermal conductivity as a function of the of thickness for the red triangle triangles are the theory, the circle is our experiment, and the and the green square is the thin the, the thin film alloy. Okay, and we always compare the three. You see that in all in all cases, the thin film alloy is slightly below what we measure and um, what is predicted by these lattice dynamic simulations. Let me tell you that the agreement between theory and experiment is surprisingly good. It's extremely good. So this line has, has a slope one. So we have very good fit in, in between theory. So we can use the theory in order to understand a little bit more what's going on in our system. And then again, if for this 33% uh, system, the 16 period super lattices, we have both theory and experiment predict uh, thermal conductivity, which is below the thin film, the thin film alloy. Uh, in order to understand a little bit more what is going on here, here we plot the transmission of the different modes as a function of, of, of frequency, both for uh, two graded samples. This is the S4 P6 that had a, a K of 2.5. This one, the, this is the one of the low uh, low thickness and low and low period and small period, and we plot the uh, the thin film alloy which is the silicon germanium of the same thickness and the graded super lattice and you see that for this thick for this period and this sample of 110 with this compositional profile we clearly see that the thermal conductivity the phonon transmission is is higher for the graded super lattices which will basically tell us that the thermal conductivity of the graded super lattice in this case is slightly above the one of the of the of the thin film alloy. If we now turn into this one, which will have a different concentration gradient, we have a slightly higher concentration profile and more interfaces. We see now that the uh, different thing happens. Now we have that the, that the graded super lattice has some dips in the low temperature region. Okay, these dips in the low temperature region could mean some, some folding or the appearance of some phonon, phonon bands. And we also have the decrease of the phonon transmission in this regime over here, which is the regime in which the super lattice, the interfaces start to play a role. And well, then the mixing of the uh, of germanium inside our system, it's also uh, playing a, a significant role. So we have a decrease in this regime and in this regime here. And that translate when we plot the, 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 the conductance as a function of frequency, we see that the silicon germanium, the 16 period has a lower thermal conductance compared over the whole frequency range, it, we, we start to, to decrease here in this, in this region here. And we see that the maximum difference is becoming in this region here between two and three uh, uh, terahertz, which is this region here. And after we go more or less the same. So basically this is telling us 
that the concentration gradients that we have in this system, this, this, this mass concentration gradients between silicon and germanium, the enhanced interface scattering because we have this number of interfaces and the formation, the probable formation of phonon bands is, is contributing to having a thermal conductivity which is below the thin film alloy. In fact, uh, from our experimental data, we can already suggest without going into, into the modeling that we should get low, uh, small values of K for samples we have quite thick, I would say, regions of silicon germanium with a, a general concentration of around 15 to 20% that are separated by thin, very thin, one to nanometer silicon rich regions. So regions of low thermal conductivity with regions of high thermal conductivity, but these regions of low thermal conductivity, they are in fact alloys in which we have this mass, this mass uh, gradient. And if we reproduce this in the modeling, Basically, this is reproducing this type of material. This model is now reproducing a material which is has thick nine nanometer regions of silicon uh, germanium that goes from 10 to 15 that have a very low K to and thin one nanometer regions of amorphous silicon that sorry of amorphous or silicon rich layer with a high uh, with a high thermal conductivity and we see that this type of, of super lattice even even with high with long periods of 10, 20 nanometers, is able to have thermal conductivity, a thermal conductance values that are below the thin film alloy limit. So we can predict now the formation of super lattices with long periods in which at the end, this uh, formation of phonon bands, the formation of uh, these gradients and the effect of the mass alloy of the mass scattering is uh, giving us thermal conductivities below the thin film, below the thin film alloy. Okay, let me. Uh, okay, uh, let me jump into a completely different system. These are porous silicon uh, nanowires, so we have to measure them in a very different way. These are nanowires which are uh, more or less hundred nanometers nanowires with a very low thermal conductance, and then we have to measure by another method, and then we use these uh, suspended structures in which we have this type of uh, systems, suspended structures. Our systems, there are 400 microns uh, in length. And basically in those systems, the, the, uh, the conductance of the samples that we are measuring here, they are around one three nanowatt per K. The uh, conductance of the beams is around 70, 80 nanowatts per K in this regime. And basically we impose temperature difference of 5K in those systems. The way of measuring here, is quite simple, at least uh, conceptually. Basically, what we do is we put our nanowires in between these two platforms that are isolated, okay, uh, one from from the other, and then we hit one of the uh, of the of the of the areas here. In this case, this left area, we hit it five k above the, uh, the 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 bath temperature, and then we see the temperature. We measure the temperature increase in the other in the other one. We measure the temperature increase in the other one, and from the temperature increase in this one, we can get to the thermal conductance of the material. At the end, when you solve these the flux, the heat flux in here, by assuming that you have a one-dimensional heat flux, and then the thermal conductance of the of, of the material that you have here can be just written this way. This TH is the temperature, the temperature difference between your heater and the bath. This TH, TS is the temperature difference between your sensor and the bath and QH and QHL, this is the power that is released in the central region and the power that is released in the arms of this, of this heater. So we know all these parameters, we know these parameters, we measure the temperatures and we have to measure them with high resolution. So we do the measurement in frequency. So in, uh, with, the, with the three omega voltage and basically by doing quite sensitive measurements here, we can get the, a good measurement of the thermal conductance of the nanowire. It is important in those measurements that you select your structure in order to, go, to do a good measurement. You can see here, this is the uncertainty in the measurement of the thermal conductance of the sample as a function of the thermal conductance of the sample. And that goes through a, a parabolic shape, basically meaning that if you want to measure your thermal conductance with a good uncertainty around 10%, you need to be in this region here. So you need to tackle and you need to have appropriate values 
for these for these different uh, for these different uh, parameters here in order to be able to do measurements in the in a, in, a, in the low uncertainty uh, region. Of course, if you want to measure a sample that has a thermal conductance in here, you can change the thermal conductance of the beams, and then you can move this curve up and left and right by changing this uh, this part. Okay, so basically uh, we are going to measure uh, porous silicon nanowires. Uh, I will not go into the detail of this, but this is important the way they are grown because that will have an impact on the measurement that I'll show you later. So they are grown by uh, metal assisted chemical etching. And basically we start with a P-dope uh, silicon wafer that is etched by this solution. And the etching goes from the walls, from the, from the exterior of the walls. And I'll show you later that that has an impact on the on the on the on the pore uh, microstructure, and that has an impact on the thermal on the thermal conductivity. So basically, these are these are porous nanowires that have porosity in between thirty five and forty five percent, and we've done three uh, D tomography on those systems in order to 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 see the uh, the porosity, which is not easy to calculate if you have a single a single nanowire. Okay, so what we do is we take these nanowires from the from the from the wafer, uh, and then we can put them onto our platforms. The crystalline regions of the nanowires, they are kind of uh, five, uh, eight nanometers, and the pores, they are similar sizes. So we have, of course, a lot of boundary scattering inside this system, and we might expect, of course, that will have a strong effect that has been shown for many different uh, porous materials uh, on, the, on the thermal conductivity. Here we have nanowires with diameters ranging from 90 to 160, and with different lengths from, from one to eight, uh, to eight microns. Um, we need to take account of some background conductance, parasitic conductance that we have at every temperature. So we measure the suspended structures without, without, the, without the sample. And then we measure this parasitic uh, conductance that is used to the near field radiation and to this, uh, uh, to this thermal path that we have uh, through, the, through, the, through, the, through, through the edge. And basically, that's quite low. But when we go to these temperatures, it starts to be important. This is 600 picowatts, and that can represent around 20, 30 percent of the thermal conductance of the of the of the nanowire in this in this case. The way we put the nanowires, they can be placed in different ways. But we use focus ion beams, so we take the nanowire with the fib, we place it onto the structure, and then we glue it. And then we have a structures with different distances in between the platforms. So we put wires of different lengths and different diameters. And this is these are the results that I'll be showing you in this in this slide. So these are the results of five different uh, nanowires. But first, you know that they have very low thermal thermal conductivity compared to bulk silicon, which is 150 watts meter square. And these ones they have uh, values of the thermal conductivity that go from 0.7 to 1.7 watt meter square. So it's much uh, reduced. Here I'm plotting the thermal conductivity as a function of length. Okay. And basically, what you see here, there is not a well-defined length dependence. That basically is telling you that the mechanism of diffusion is not ballistic, which uh, you could guess a priori, but that basically is diffusive. So because there is a lot of phonon uh, scattering in those in those materials, no? and um, so uh, and these 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 values they are kind of the minimum value of the thermal conductivity in silicon, no? which is around 1.4. So we have this this amorphous-like conducti conductivity in silicon. The other important thing is that, of course, we are hanging the nanowires onto the platforms, and therefore we are introducing a thermal contact resistance. The thermal contact resistance is a big issue in those on those measurements. Uh, more important, the more conductor, the more the more conductive is your system. Here, the thermal conductance of our nanowires is very small, and we can check what is the role of the thermal. Uh, if there is any thermal contact resistance, by plotting the inverse of the conductance. And multiply by the by the section as a function of the length. If the contact thermal resistance was dominating thermal transport, we should expect to see something quite flat over here because the thermal conductance would be dominated by the by the by the contact. Okay, but in this case we have a, a quite linear plot that is telling us that in fact they are proportional to the length, and this is telling us that the thermal contact resistance is not playing a dominant role. In fact, what we measure here within the uncertainty of those measurements is that the contact resistance is quite small, is lower than 10 to the minus 6 <coughs> meters square per bar. And this is less than 50% of the total thermal resistance that we measure on our, on our nanowires. 
Um, now, if you plot the thermal conductivity as a function of the di diameter, you see a relationship that seems kind of linear. So we have a dependence of the thermal conductivity on the diameter. And this was quite unexpected the first time we observed this behavior, because you might guess that the outer surface of the nanowire will not have an effect because we have a lot of internal boundary scattering of the, of, of the phonons. Therefore, the fact that we have a 90, 110, or 120 nanometer should not affect as dramatically as this in the value of the, of the thermal conductivity, unless, unless we might have some poor anisotropy. And this is what we seem to have in those systems because of the way we etch that them from solution and um, um, because this is done and the unapplied voltage. So there are some electrical lines that guide the etching. We have like a kind, kind of a Christmas tree uh, etching uh, a poor microstructure that is telling us that we have something kind a different thermal conductance in, the, in this region and a different than in the outer region because of the pore distribution. So what we think is that we see this dependence of the diameter due to the anisotropy that we have in the pore distribution inside, inside our, 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 our nanowires. In fact, we've done extensive characterization and here you can see the pores and you can see how in the central region, the pores, they run more parallel to the, uh, to the, to the, to, to the non lone axis of the wire. Well, in this region, you have these pores that go transversal to the, to, to the axis. And since the heat flux is measured in this direction, we might have like a core component, like a, a shell component. So we have like a two parallel uh, phonon uh, transmissions that are uh, uh, that are the, the reason for this uh, for this uh, for this behavior. Uh, so we did uh, a collaboration with Ricardo and Xavier and Xavier Cartucha, and they did a protein equilibrium molecular dynamic simulations, not on this system but on similar systems in which they have. A core which was a single crystalline core which was surrounded by pores. So you have these two, <coughs> this uh, system that is done with two different uh, thermal conductivities. And I will not be showing their, 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 their molecular dynamics results, but at the end they were able to see that this kind of geometry, you can uh, it can be modeled by a very simple, a very simple uh, equation that basically tells you tells you that you have two paths of conductance. Two parallel paths, one that goes through the inner core and one that goes through the parallel one. If you use these parallel conductance, you can get this uh, this thermal conductivity. By the way, the thermal conductivity that, I, that I'm giving you is the effective thermal conductivity. It's considering the whole the whole diameter of the nanowires without taking into account the porosity. So it's not the intrinsic uh, uh, conductivity of the crystalline regions. And when you do this modeling by assuming these thermal conductivities so that you have a lower thermal conductivity in the shell because the pore microstructure and a higher thermal conductivity in the inside, uh, you can get a quite, rep a quite good uh, understanding of the phenomena that we have. So basically we can say that our nanowires, surprisingly, they have this core shell uh, microstructure in which you could simply model them by a core shell model of parallel conductance path that provides this simple interpretation for the uh, for the thermal uh, for the thermal um, this is another issue that might be interesting that we have not explored in detail is that if we do a uh, temperature dependence of the thermal conductivity uh, we see of course that we have like a plateau in this region this is normal because of this amorphous nanocrystalline character but we see that the slope in this regime here has, is, uh, has a slope in between one and two, okay? And that's basically mean that uh, this, uh, the phono propagation in those, in those materials may be uh, modified because of a modification of the, group from, of, of the group velocity or because some uh, dependence of the specularity on the frequency of the, of the phono. So this, all these, all these um, the reasons might explain this, uh, this, uh, this variation of the, uh, of the of the slope of the thermal conductivity, we have not gone into detail, but it may be interesting to explore that in a little bit more detail. Okay, so let me pay a little bit more attention onto the last uh, system. This is uh, slightly different. These now are disordered materials, completely disordered. These are glasses, okay, amorphous solids, and in fact they are made of um, 
organic molecules, okay? So basically we are gonna see how we can measure the in-plane thermal conductivity in those materials. But I, um, what I'm more interested in here is discussing a little bit the role of anisotropy. We can use this in-plane technique in order to understand if the way the molecules are oriented in our film, it has an impact on thermal conductivity. It's been known for some years that the way these molecules are oriented, this has an effect on the electrical conductivity. It depends on the electrons fly or move or on the direction of the, of the length or in the in-plane or out of plane. I will, I, will, I will get to that in a minute. And we wanted to explore, to explore this. The way we do that is we do measurements in these thin films. These are films that are evaporated and we do measurements that most of the time are in situ inside the evaporation chambers. And basically we do two types of measurements, cross plane with the standard three omega, but we also do within plane with this modification with the, with the, with the three omega technique that we call, that we call three omega volume. The three omega Volklin is due to Volklin, that's why his name. So he developed this, this modification of the three omega. He started to doing that in DC mode. So basically this is this geometry. This is a thin metal strip that is sitting on top of a membrane. And of course the heat will be dissipated in this, uh, in this direction. Okay, so basically you have the heat release here and heat is dissipated, is dissipated in, this, uh, in this direction. And he did these measurements with a constant input power, uh, with a steady state profile. And he was able in a steady state to measure the thermal conductance just by applying this equation in which the input power is the conductance multiplied by the, by, by the temperature difference in between this central part and between the frame that is kept at a given, at a given temperature. Uh, a few years later, the group of Olivier, uh, Bourgeois in Grenoble, they developed a little bit more this methodology by going into, into a three omega dynamic method by which you can gain a lot of uh, sensitivity on your measurement and uh, using locking strategies. So they improve the sensitivity of the technique by doing measurements with sensitivities down to 10 to the minus three bat meter K with uh, signal to noise or noise to signal ratios that were, were down to 10 to the minus three. So we have even developed a little bit more this technique in order to increase sensitivity. We are now in noise, noise to signal ratios that are 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five. And then we can use this technique and we have used it in the lab in order to map how we can measure in situ the growth of a material and how it affects the thermal conduction of a membrane. And then we can map the growth of the film even before coalescence. So we can see when we have some islands on top of our membrane, we start to see some changes in the thermal, in the thermal conductance. And I'll come to here and I'll go back in a second. When we have, this is the, the thermal conductance as a function of thickness when we are growing a film and we can map the small changes of the thermal conductance. This is before coalescence, and this is when we have the film that is growing. And from this slope, we can determine the thermal conductance of the system with a great, uh, with a with a, with a very high accuracy. Okay, let me go back. The uh, the uh, the three omega Volklin technique is based on this geometry. So it's basically a thin film strip. Now the width is quite thin; it's around uh, two to five microns. Okay, this is now very long. This is two to three millimeters and it's separated by the frame through a membrane that is typically 100 nanometers. It can be down to 30 nanometers. We typically use uh, 150 nanometers as so well, the thickness of our silicon nitride membranes. And the frame in this case is located at 125 microns from the, from the, from the inner, from the inner uh, strip, okay? And then basically what we, what we do is we inject the one omega current and we measure the three omega voltage in here. And we do that with respect to a reference sensor because we do that in differential mode that is located here. And therefore we can cancel the one omega, the one omega com component, and then we can amplify the, the, three omega, the three omega signal. The interesting thing is that you can do this analysis in frequency and you can get to the thermal conductance equation Okay, you can do that in DC mode. That is pretty easy to do. Here we all, we don't have sample. We only have the membrane, and this is the thermal conductivity and the thickness of the membrane. L is uh, this dimension, and little l is uh, this dimension here. And uh, we can do that in frequency. And of course, we have that the, that the thermal conductance depends on frequency. But we, if we go to a slow enough frequencies, and a slow enough here, it's around one hertz. 
you can see that the delta t to omega equals the delta t dc. So in this frequency regime, we can directly, we can skip, we can simplify the process. We can really skip the frequency dependent of the g to omega and the g to omega will be close to the one that we have in, the, in dc. So basically the delta t to omega would be equal to the delta t dc and we can simply equate and determine the uh, thermal conductance by using this uh, this procedure now with a very high with a very high uh, sensitivity. So we use this in order to measure these organic materials. And let me tell you a little bit on how we grow them because this is important for the analysis that I'll be doing later on. These are molecules that are vapor deposit; they are just evaporated very simply, and uh, therefore we. Can, but changing the conditions of the deposition, we can deposit them in with different densities and with different molecular orientations. Okay, remember that these are not crystals; these are glasses, so they show a glass transitions. The molecules are disordered, but instead, in spite in spite of this disorder, they show molecular orientation, and we can change their density by quite a high amount by <coughs> by playing with the temperature and with the position rate. This is now a field of research that is a field in itself that is called ultra stable glasses field of research in which we can explore these glasses that have outstanding properties with respect to other glasses, this higher density, higher stabilities, and this molecular packing and isotope. So what we want to explore with our in-plane technique is to see if the density of the in-plane or the molecular anisotropy, they play a role in the thermal, in the thermal conductivity. And um, first, let me show you how these molecules orient as a function of the deposition temperature. This is the deposition temperature as, a, as, a, as a, the ratio with respect to the glass transition temperature. And let me go back to this cartoon one second. This is the molecule that we are depositing. Okay, this is TPD, it's an organic semiconductor. This is the vector that will define the lone axis. Okay, and this is the zeta, the, the zeta component. Okay, the zeta component is the one that is in the growth direction. So basically we define an order parameter, which is uh, in relation to this angle, theta, theta t, theta, this, this one, okay? Basically when the order parameter is uh, positive here, we have that the molecules are oriented uh, perpendicular to the substrate, because this is on, on average. When the order parameter is negative, we have that the molecules are mostly oriented parallel to the, to the substrate. And you see that by changing the temperature, we can change the orientation of the molecules, even that we have a glass, and we can go from this horizontal orientation to the vertical orientation to the isotropic regime. So we can have this different, and we want to understand the thermal transport of those. There is also a change in density. At the same time that we change the orientation, we change the density by as much as 1.4%. And when we grow in this region here, at 0.85 TG closely, the density of our films is 1.5, 1.5, 1.4 times uh, percent in percentage higher than the one of the of the isotropic glass. This might sound little, but this is quite quite important and has and might have an important uh, effect in many different in many different properties. So we measure the thermal conductivity of those of those materials by the procedure that I just, I just described. The sensitivity when we go to conductance is very high. So we have 0 0.065 per nanometer, and the signal to noise ratio that we can reach is a noise to signal ratio. So here is the 10 to the minus four, even to 10 to the minus five. Okay, so this is the data. This is the in-plane. This is the in-plane thermal conductivity. The one, so we have the thin film, and we measure the heat flux in this direction. So we measure the in-plane thermal, thermal conductivity. And these are the values as a function of the deposition temperature. Here, we have the glass transition. The glass transition temperature is here. So we see that there is a change in the thermal conductivity, the in-plane thermal conductivity as a function of the orientation of the molecules. For instance, the, we, we know that samples that are here, that the molecules are parallel to the surface on average. Molecules that are here, they are preferentially aligned in the perpendicular. And molecules that are here, they are isotropic, okay? The me these measurements are done with a delta T of two, three K, with a frequency of 0.51 hertz. And the, these, these, these measurements are done at a single temperature. So we go the films at different temperatures, then we go to 296 and we measure the, the conductance at this, uh, at this temperature. Uh, so we want to understand 
what is the correlation of the thermal conductivity with either density or molecular entropy? So does density influence thermal conductivity? A priori, we, we would say yes. The denser the material, the higher the sound velocity, and the higher the thermal conductivity in the material. This is what we would, what we would think. But you see here that if we plot the density, this is the red curve, uh, and we plot here the thermal conductivity, there is no correlation in the meaning that we can have uh, two systems with the same density, but the thermal conductivity is very different. So there is no correlation between thermal conductivity and density. And in fact, the molecular dynamic simulation that have been done by uh, Colombo and Ricardo de Tori, they also show that you need to have a huge change in density in order to have this change in thermal conductivity. So we can rule out density as the major factor of uh, influence on the thermal conductivity. On the contrary, uh, molecular orientation does seem to play a role. Now we, we plot the other parameter. This is these red symbols, okay? This is the orientation. And we plot our thermal conductivity data for TPD. And this is in a, in a relative coordinate with respect to the isotropic layer. And we see that they follow more or less the same trend. The layers that are horizontally, uh, in horizon that lie horizontally parallel to the parallel to the substrate, so they have higher thermal conductivity. The ones that are here, they have lower, they have lower, lower thermal conductivity. So in fact, it seems that the thermal that the in-plane thermal conductivity is favored when molecules are aligned planar uh, to, the, to the to the to the substrate, and that basically means that uh, the uh, the way the molecules are uh, oriented in our field has an important impact on the on, on thermal transport. So the uh, thermal anisotropy ratio, if now we measure the in-plane thermal conductivity and we do cross-plane measurements with the three omega, and we compare with respect to the isotropic material, we see difference that are around 40%. Okay, this is not a lot, but you have to take into account that our molecules, they are planar, but in the plane, they are isotropic. So they are only oriented in the out-of-plane direction. They are isotropic, okay? Uh, and uh, so basically, if we are able to put the molecules, all of them in the same direction, but be in the system at glass, we might have a stronger effect on those systems. And this is, in fact, what has been shown in the modeling. I will not go into details, but there is a model of this structure has been done by Luciano Colombo and Ricardo de Tori from, the, from Cagliari. And they have built this type of systems. This is the isotropic, and these are uh, uh, thin films that are anisotropic with the anisotropy that we have in our layers with similar densities and similar grass transition temperatures. And we see that what we have experimentally is kind of this. So theoretically, they see a thermal anisotropy ratio that is around 16%. We did see 37%, but they go up to 95% when we impose that the molecules are now aligned also in the in-plane direction. So you can get a much higher thermal and isotropy ratio in between the out of plane and the, and the in-plane. Uh, what is the reason for that? So they did modeling and 1D, 1D analogs in which now the molecules, they are stacked like this or they are stacked like this with the long axis. These are these representations here. This is the stacking uh, along the, the pi pi, the, 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 the benzene rings. And this is the stacking along the longitudinal direction. And you see that the, uh, the, the backbone, the one that is in this direction, it has a, a strong, uh, a, a higher molecular interaction. It has a stronger molecular interaction and a steeper branch of the, uh, of the, of the, of the, of the Van der Waals interaction, which might uh, basically mean that they have a high group velocity and that will, that will translate in a higher thermal conductivity. This is important because the strength of molecular interactions is very important because the mechanism of uh, phonon conduction here is by hopping of lattice vibrations. So the stronger is the interaction, the, the, the easier will be the conduction. And what this is telling us is the interaction is stronger in this direction than in this, is in this direction. So we think that might have an interest because you can make a, 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 a thermal resistance analog in series in between this one is the in-plane. So the thermal resistance here is smaller than when this is in the, in the opposite direction, in the out-of-plane direction. And in fact, what we see is the high, the thermal conductivity can be changed by a factor of two, probably, in between the in-plane and the out-of-plane. But the interesting thing here is that the electrons, they go just in the opposite direction. 
So electron transport is much easier here because of the pi pi overlapping that in here in this direction. So you can have a much higher electrical conductivity in this direction than in this direction. And therefore you have a high thermal conductivity, uh, high thermal conductivity with a low electrical conductivity that might be materials that might be uh, interesting for some, uh, for some applications. We have still not measured the electrical conductivity on this specific one. We are doing this measurement, that, but it's been shown uh, previously on other systems that by changing the molecular orientation in between this one and this and this and the isotropic, you can change by an order of magnitude the electrical, the electrical conductivity. And with that, I finish. Uh, in the conclusions, let me tell you that uh, I've shown you that by three omega, we were, we were able to go uh, to measure these pseudomorphic super lattices with stellar concentration gradients. And here we were able to have thermal conductivities uh, below the thin film, the thin film alloy limit for some, uh, for some characteristics of the super lattices. Uh, we did measure the thermal conductivity of these porous silicon nanowires. They have very low thermal conductivities uh, in the order of the amorphous uh, limit. And in fact, the thermal conductivity is uh, influenced by the anisotropy in the power uh, distribution with this Chris, uh, Christmas tree uh, porosity. And uh, I have also shown you that we can do highly sensitive measurements. And, and if with those measurements, we can uh, get enough sensitivity to demonstrate the influence of molecular anisotropy on the thermal conductivity of these thin film organic glasses. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Javier. Very nice presentation. So, sorry, before finishing, let me just tell you acknowledging my collaborators, which is extremely important because they did most of the job. So, the previous uh, PhD students, Pablo, Juan, and, and Gustavo, they did all these measurements that I've been showing you. My collaborator in all of this, Aitor, which is important for the development of these techniques. And um, Libertad Abad, who is helping us in all these microfabrication procedures for all these systems and different collaborators, the theory, Xavier, we had a lot of talking about these uh, super lattices, the, uh, the IGMAP group in the super lattices, the modeling with uh, Ricardo, uh, the, the growth of the, of the nanowires, Luca Guadino at Inrim, for the organics, uh, Luciano Colombo, and we still keep this, this collaboration, and for the super lattices, Sunda Chen and David Donario. So thank you all of them for, for their collaboration.